this is the, the final session of the three days that we, that we, we decided to give wristbands to people and say, you know, come for one day, two days, or three days. Um, that was following our business summit and following our schools day on Thursday. And some of you have been here all three days, neglecting your family, your lives, not washing <laughs> your knickers. I mean, it's um, a real tribute to you. And along with that, of course, there's Sam still signing away, along with Russell and, um, and Rob <laughs> and Abdul and Tracy. Yeah, so thank you very much. And those of you who've contributed to the wall downstairs or on this floor, I've lost all track of geography and time. But anyway, there is the, the um, Robert F. Kennedy sort of wall capturing your thoughts and ideas that uh, Julia and Jill have done. And it's now full and, and urgent with inquiry and demand and uh, opportunity and excitement to make human rights a reality. Um, I'm going to actually start, if that's all right, with thank yous, because by the time we get to the end of this discussion, I want to go away with, with the thinking that the discussion promotes, rather than sort of just round it up with a bow. So if you just put the lights up again on the audience, if you don't mind. Um, I, I, I know on behalf of, of Dennis, who's there at the back, so Dennis, the, the chief executive of the Robert F. Kennedy organization, that we, actually, why don't you just come down the front here for a second, mm. Dennis. Okay, we would like to thank uh, Home for having us, and we would like to thank all the teams. All the teams. Yeah, which I mean, collectively, all the teams, all the tech teams, all the home the staff, the catering staff, etc., etc. And um, we'd also like to thank our own festival teams. Maria at the back, who is the, 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 the silent convener okay. of all of these things. There she is. There. <laughs> Thank you. And and Caroline, who's driven the poetry right from beginning, middle and end, which were led by Simon Armitage, and of course the last night is tonight. It's been absolutely amazing. Um, thank you, Caroline. And then, then all the rest of the team that we have, I think we applauded them at lunchtime. We've had a bit of applause already. So we'll, we'll just say the, the, the Ripples of Hope team and the, the home team have been absolutely fantastic. Um, but, I, but this is, uh, we've already thanked him once, but I just want to say one more time, what a brilliant person you've been. And um, that's enough, you can go away again. <laughs> <laughs> um, at the end of this session, uh, Young Identity, who, who are wonderful poets, youngish, I mean, not that young, um, but youngish poets <laughs> who have been collecting up every day all the kind of information, the, the, the themes, the ideas, and turning them into poetic work, and they'll be performing at the end of this session. So please go out and hear them on the, um, the soapbox that we've used for, an, for, for lots of things. And, and I mean, the, the, the weekend has been absolutely incredible because we've, you know, we've had some very severe and extreme moments of, of, of sadness you know, the, the, probably the most significant was when um, one of our speakers, uh, herself an Afghanistan judge who had to go into exile, rang on her mobile an Afghanistani judge in Kabul, in hiding. Some of you were, maybe were here for this. And, and she spoke to us in person and said, I'm in hiding and this is my situation and please can you help me? And I'm sitting here waiting to die. And then, you know, and there was nothing else to say. I mean, that was what she said to us live from Kabul. And, um, you know, that was a very extreme moment. It was also kind of horrific to hear today um, uh, Nimran talking about Nigeria and, you know, years of, 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 um, of the, the ecocide that is happening in, in Nigeria, in the Delta region, and, and the impact of that in terms of, of the poison of the, the, the water and the poison of the air. And obviously the kind of the fallout for people's lives. It was also very, very um, thought-provoking to have the, the, the filmmaker from Hong Kong talking about how he'd had to flee. And now his film, he's you know, made it his life's work to try to use his filmmaking platform in this country to allow the voices of others in Hong Kong to be heard. And we, you know, we cancelled this festival 
when we were going to do it in February, and we cancelled it when we were going to do it in May. We've ended up doing it in September. But if you think about it, you know, we could have, each time we cancelled it, we would have been on the verge of another moment when we needed to talk, of, to talk of about another terrible situation within, the, you know, human um, uh, calamities. But the fact that there are so many people all over the world concerned with how we can make change happen, concerned with picking up the voice of the voiceless and amplifying it, it is the reason why we've got lots of hope, isn't it? I mean, you're here, that gives all of us a lot of hope. Um, and this quote that we keep on, with these ripples of hope, every time you stand up for injustice, you're sending out a ripple of hope. And that can just be a tiny action, you know, starting a food bank, or just putting something in a food bank. Uh, the, the tiny things we do, they do make a difference. So whether we've been talking about children in care or homelessness, whether we've been talking about climate justice or the Equalities Act, all of it makes uh, an incredible tapestry, actually, of the things that humans have decided that we need to care about. And, you know, we've kind of gone, well, I'll do this and you do that and one another. And everybody is doing something. And there's not think passive about coming along for three days to listen in order to kind of regalvanize yourself and then think, what will I do next? And I know we've had lots of conversations about you, what you all feel you will do next. But there are four people here who are as, as committed as possible to this idea of using a platform to make change happen, um, whether that be an artistic platform or a platform in parliament or in, 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 in any kind of political circumstance. Um, and I'm just going to introduce them, and we're going to talk a little bit about what makes a human rights city. And I'd like you to add in your own thoughts about this too. Um, so from my far right, um, Jay Bernard. Uh, Jay is a writer and artist from London. They were named Sunday Times Young Writer of the Year in 2020. And as well as writing Surge, a collection of poems based on the archives related to the 1981 New Cross fire, their work has been performed and exhibited across the UK and internationally. And Jay is going to read their poem, uh, created from Article 28, uh, free and fair, and then they will also be performing tonight as the, in the finale of the declaration, the poetic declarations. So thanks, Jay, for being here. Um, <laughs> Emma, Green, Emma Greenwood is a 17-year-old youth voice and climate activist, current youth MP for Bury, member of Youth Strike for Climate Manchester, and Fridays for Future Digital, uh, which we'll hear more about. Um, Andy Burnham is Andy Burnham, obviously. Um, <laughs> and um, Andy is elected mayor of Greater Manchester in, and was re-elected second term in May 2021, which everybody's very pleased about. And prior to being mayor, Andy was MP for Lee from 2001. Um, and then Rabia Begum is a student artist and activist from Oldham stroke Liverpool. We were just discussing that, weren't we? Yeah, so I'm, I'm from Oldham, but I'm a student from Liverpool. That's the Oldham stroke okay, Liverpool. And, and yeah. Liverpool. And <laughs> Liverpool just tends to claim anybody who it thinks is talented and just go, yeah, the Liverpool. <laughs> um, She's a board member on Manchester Climate Change Youth Board and working on the newly formed Manchester Art Gallery Climate Justice Group as an artist. So, I, I mean, obviously you've all been thinking a great deal about what, what justice looks like as a whole. And then there is a sort of issue today specifically about climate justice. But we've, so before we come on to the idea of a human rights city, Emma, I was going to come to you because you, you are obviously interested in direct action. Yeah. Um, and people find direct action both frightening and very useful once it's happened. So, yeah. you know, very glad that it, we had people chaining themselves to the railings to get me the vote. Would I want to do it myself? I don't know whether I would have done. You know, and this is always the problem, isn't it? About where do you find the courage uh, and the sort of standing as an outsider away from maybe your family or your friends or your, you know, community group to do something that is people are going to find inconvenient. Um, can you talk to us about that idea of direct action and why you as a young person feel that's something that we, we ought to be doing? Yes, I think a lot of the reason why I feel comfortable doing it maybe is because there is such a good network of young people around the globe that are taking direct action. And I definitely think Greta Thunberg sort of 
lighting that fire and giving everyone the spark to do that and creating this sense of collective action and collectivism is so, so powerful because it's, it's difficult to be the first person to do something. And that's why I think Greta is so incredible. But then she's kind of created this wave of movement of young people who support each other and lift each other up and reassure each other when things do get hard because there is always that risk of with direct action that you do get people who obviously look down on it and say, oh, this is inconvenient. But then you have to sort of reassure yourself that this is all because we're scared. As young people, this is a, a real thing that our future, we can't take for granted anymore like adults can now. And it is motivated as something that we have to do. It's not a choice. We don't have this look that I'd say maybe older generations do where they can sit back and go, you know what, it's bad, but it isn't necessarily my problem. And I think that, that fear and, uh, in a sense, anger is what motivates us to take to the streets and it's why we do it. We'd rather be sat in a classroom, prioritising our education, and I'd rather not have to m miss classes to fight for this. But the fact is that, that without it, for years, scientists were screaming about the danger we're in, but they were never listened to. And so I've sort of I've taken that with so many other young people around the world and have gone, this is what I have to do, and this is my obligation to both myself, my future, but also those yet to come. And, and them having the safe and, and prosperous planet that we've had the opportunity of growing up with. And uh, you've got a strike coming up, is that right? I have. Um, the first one back is next Friday. Um, after the much waste, obviously, during the pandemic, it just wasn't safe. And we have to treat every crisis like a crisis, and so we did. Um, but yes, next Friday, the 24th, um, is the first global strike for climate back since the pandemic. And we're just hoping to mobilise people again, and we're asking people to wear masks and obviously be COVID safe. But yeah, to get that, that atmosphere going again, and you do just come out of a strike feeling so empowered, and, and you do feel so hopeful, because there is just so many people so passionate about what we're fighting for. And so if anybody wants to come, it isn't just a youth strike, it's supposed to be intergenerational, so please do, uh, and bring anyone along you can. Okay, so it's a youth, it's a youth strike, yes. which means that people use their time differently. In other words, they don't go into formal education or formal or their jobs. Yes. And they go onto this, it, they put their time into this space instead. Yes, precisely. So I'm going to be missing my geography lesson, which I think is quite ironic. Um, <laughs> but I, th I think it's quite, it's very geography based. Um, but yeah, no, it's basically about, I suppose we're sacrificing something because we feel passionate about it. And as young people, I, obviously I'm under 18, I can't vote. The only real mechanism I have is through my education and through striking in that sense of, so I've sort of taken that with other young people and gone, right, I can't vote, what can I do? And I've used my education and I've used that voice I can have through email, email my college, go, this is why I'm doing it. And I let them know. And, and through that sort of making a statement, um, I hope to have the same sort of impacts that I would have if I could vote. Okay, so you, you can't vote, but you, just talk to us a bit about being a youth MP because that is like sort of in the, in the waiting room for being a proper MP. I mean, are you intending to go into formal politics as well? Um, and it's always like, what if in the future? I think being an MP is, is such a powerful role. And through being a youth MP, I've, I've had so many amazing opportunities. I think maybe my sort of thing is more on an international level through doing Fridays for Future Digital. I've got to meet so many young people around the world who obviously are in, in much worse circumstances dealing with the climate crisis than, than we are in the UK. And I think I found a lot of my passion through supporting them and through getting people like that to COP26. And so if that is a mechanism of becoming a, an MP or becoming maybe... Um, uh, on an international level, working with NGOs, I think it's however that plays out, I hope to kind of pursue that in the future, so yes. Yeah, so, I, I mean, I think it's <laughs> great. <laughs> uh, and we were talking earlier, Rabi, about the fact that, you know, you're, um, I mean, you know, you've been doing this for quite a long time now, relatively speaking, like you're 17 and you're 24 or something. 24, yeah. 24. Um, and, you know, I always think it's interesting when somebody puts on their CV, I'm an artist and an activist, I would put that mm. too. But, you know, when I was younger, um, the, the, uh, the arts industry really disliked that. I mean, they still dislike it, actually, to be honest, in, to, in, in some context. But it was like, well, choose, you know, be yeah. one or the other. Are you a proper artist or are you busy paddling around in politics? Um, whereas, you know, all through the centuries, artists have put their voice for the cases of social justice. Mm -hmm. It's just that once they're dead, people just say, well, that's a piece of classical work. Yeah. Um, but how do you use your art? I mean, what, 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 you know, what's the way that you use your art to bring about change? Yeah, so for myself, I work with um, families. So I work with families and young people, and I create um, workshops and educational workshops. And through that, I'm trying to gauge 
um, what the climate crisis is and what it is within the different activities that's going on. Um, in one of the workshops that I did uh, was on reduce, refuse, recycle, um, and we looked at and reuse, um, and we looked at creating a green amount topolis with um, junk modeling kind of activity with cardboard boxes. And it was really interesting because um, a few of the young children had actually come up with spaces where they were having um, thinking spaces. So you can see that it, there's an importance there for having green spaces, but not even just um, relevant to, you know, building, well, how do we build a, a greener um, a greener Manchester, but that real important aspect of mental health as well. So I think that need for um, engaging with young people and families and also bringing in families and families that might not necessarily um, know how to or know what the climate crisis is or um, might feel like, hey, you know, how does this relate to me? Because a lot of the times right now with COVID, um, a lot of people will be like, COVID is um, the massive, the big issue for me. It's putting food on the plate, that is the biggest mm -hmm. issue for me. Um, but then I can come in and, and talk about the aspect of um, food security, and that comes into climate justice too. Um, so there's there's that combination. So in terms of my art practice, that would be um, that the, I suppose, the educational um, aspect and the creative workshops that I do. Right, so you're, yeah. you're basically creating a sort of Legos are wrong, and uh, but uh, like a yeah. cardboard design yeah. where you're getting people to think, well, if you were creating your ideal place, what would it contain and what would it not have? Yeah. It wouldn't have bad air, presumably, and it yeah. wouldn't have overcrowding, but it would have... And it, so what you're saying is that the young people said, we, we don't just want green spaces, we want thinking spaces. Yeah. That is really interesting, isn't it? It is, Because yeah. it also says to you, they don't think of school as thinking spaces then. They don't mm. think of their home maybe as thinking spaces. Mm. And that's... Well, that's quite thought-provoking because yeah. you know one of the things we've talked about this whole weekend is education and how you know we're very ambivalent about giving kids the right to think. You know, we seem to give them a lot of stuff that they're supposed to know, but not necessarily a chance to think for themselves. Um, Jay, can I just come to you? I don't know how you would describe your artwork and whether you would think of yourself through your poetry as always engaged in social issues or whether you sometimes just say, no, do you know what, I just want to discuss balloons or, mm. or the colour yellow. Um, but, you know, where does your yearning for social justice play its well, way out in your work? I think um, the thing that gets confused sometimes with the artist-activist duality that people seem very intrigued by hmm. is that you have a right to both right you've got a right to talk about this injustice but you have just as much right to talk about those flowers in that vase um, it, it can't be ever be one or the other so yes I, I do occasionally write pretty poems that aren't about children burning to death in a house I do do that yeah. Um, and I think it's kind of important to be able to exist in the world in where you can do both and not not be seen as a sellout if you do one or some kind of, you know, hoity-toity, you know, middle class, whatever, if you do the other. Yeah. It, it's a, a, a big pressure, I think, on politicians, artists who say that they have activism in their you know, portfolio, as you like, in there. You know, it, there's always the pressure that once you put your head above the parapet and you say, I'm interested in human rights, then it's like, unless you're perfect, then you're easily damned. And obviously we're humans, so we're not going to be perfect. And I think a lot of the reason why people don't step forward is that they're frightened that they'll get kind of pilloried for the slip-ups. Um, well, we can see that happens. Um, Andy, you've been a politician for a very long time. And it's a very <coughs> exposed space to stand in. Um, and it's particularly exposed, actually, if you do say, I stand for social justice, which you always have said. Because, if, you know, just like this festival, this sort of thing, how do you cover everything that there is to cover? How do mm. you know about everything you're supposed to cover? <coughs> and how are you not a human? You know, so you'll never get anything wrong. Um, <laughs> um, the, but uh, and now... You know, not just a politician, but a leader. So this this idea of kind of allowing yourself to be vulnerable 
and taking in new knowledge and admitting that you can't know everything and you can't get everything right. Is that a, is that a difficult place to maintain publicly? Oh, definitely. And, and I think it's got harder, if I'm honest, over the years because mm. you know, the, the space where you can be yourself has kind of gone more and more and uh, you, you're yeah. always out and people are always <laughs> watching. But <clears throat> I guess that, that's the job though, isn't it? You know, if anyone puts themselves forward to make decisions for other people, you've got to be there and be subject to scrutiny and, and be able to be pulled back and challenged. And so you can't hide away, from, that, is the, that is the job. Uh, the way I've looked at it increasingly is <clears throat> just be a doer rather than a sayer, I guess, is the way I, I've increasingly looked at it. Because people will generally give you a lot of space if they can see you're trying and you're actually doing what you say you're uh, trying to do. I think where politicians get in difficult You, know, you referenced the, the suffragettes at the start, Jude. I mean, I definitely feel we've lived in an era of words, not deeds. Mm -hmm. you know, we've lived in a soundbite era, definitely, in, in politics. And I think that's why Emma and her generation are taking the action that they're, they're taking. Um, you know, there's just a, a lack of follow-through, a lack of urgency. And, you know, politicians end up making statements. It's all designed just to get sort of some sort of media coverage, but actually isn't designed to change anything. And I think that's where, they, that's where politicians get into difficulty. If people are trying to do something, I think generally the public will, will see that. Um, but it's, yeah, it's not, it's not easy. I, I, I hope you weren't holding back, Emma, because you, you know, you'd be a brilliant MP, but you could be more than an MP from what, I, from what I've seen. And I just hope people won't pull back from the political space because of how it's become. Um, I think, you know things like this are about reclaiming the political space, aren't they? And yeah. making yeah. it more about, you know, good leaders, I think, in this day and age, don't just talk at people and, you know, pr make pronouncements. And actually, they open doors and give platforms for other people to go and stand on. And, you know, that, that I think, is good leadership so that you can build this bottom-up change, which is something of what we're trying to do here through yeah. devolution. I think it's very, very difficult to, to, to say to people, we really need to protect our democracies, but please don't get too involved. You know, I mean, that, that is the thing. We have to get involved in order to protect the democracies that we've fought for. So we, we sort of started to, you know, since the festival is also about the imagination, like this, the world that we want, you know, this, this equal world that we want, we've never seen it. We don't know what it looks like. I've never been in a world ever where women are equal to men. And I'm not likely to live long enough to ever see it. And, you know, my, my daughter, who's gay, is never going to see a world without trans and homophobia, I don't think, before she dies, and she's only in her 30s. And I don't know how you feel, Jay, about racial justice, but, you know, is it going to happen? All, are we all going to be equal before you die? Um, hmm. Well, you know, we c it's possible. But we, we have to imagine it's possible. And we have to believe it's possible, if, even if we have to be patient. So, I mean, let's just... Imagine for a second, what does a human rights city look like? You know, what does it mean when I say that phrase? Andy, starting with you, you know, what's your dream of a, of a city when you say a human rights city? Oh, um, I guess where everybody is free to be the person they want to be, uh, to love who they want, to have security in all aspects of, of life so that people aren't fearful of, of, of you know, the, the, there's sort of security of food, of income, of housing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's I, I feel like I know what it, it, will, it should look like. People have got a uh, right to a, a cultural life, um, to expression. Um, actually, to be free from fear, fear of harassment, young women walking down our, our streets, you know, that... So I think you kind of, I think we know what it looks like here because I think, I, I, here's my bit where I'm the mayor, the, the boastful mayor, but I think this place, it's certainly not perfect, but I think it looks more like one than, than many other places in that the fight for human rights has been very real in this city mm -hmm. uh, over the centuries, not just you know, recently. People died here yeah. uh, fighting for the simple right to vote when obviously people uh, didn't, didn't have that. So... I feel like I, I think it's, it is about um, security, isn't it? I think a, a, a city that gives every person living here security mm -hmm. of the basics 
but then the security of the knowledge that they can be who they are, who they want to be, without fear of any kind of discrimination or, or hate. So I think we know what it looks like. And, and to be honest with you, I, know, I was reading the UN Declaration today, and what has struck me is just how little actually of it has been really implemented, if we're honest. And the pandemic has brutally exposed that, you know, that mm. people haven't been able to have that uh, ability to protect their health and well-being because the nature of many people's work and housing in, in this city has stopped, has stopped that from, from happening. And actually, if you go back to you were, the point you were just making, you know, over 100 years since the suffragettes w won the right to vote for women, has that changed much enough for women? Definitely not. Mm -hmm. uh, and so some of these things haven't, you know, the, the, those big advancements haven't turned into reality. But actually, I, what gives me hope that we may see something genuinely different in our lifetimes is the generation that's sitting alongside me on this stage. And I, I know that sounds corny, but I'm going to say it because I do think they see the world differently. They, you know, they, are being, they, are, they are growing up looking at the world through different eyes. I see it in my own kids. They yeah. don't see difference in the same way that we were almost kind of, you know, encouraged to see, see difference. Um, I, I, honestly, I think the hope is, I, that's where I see the, see the hope. I think when this generation, our MPs and international uh, leaders, you know, my generation of politicians has messed it up massively, hasn't they, <laughs> basically? And I think you're the ones who are going to put it right. So there you are. That's, so, <laughs> that's my mean, thought for the day. Okay, there are moments when generational change does happen, actually. I mean, there are those great leap forward moments and, uh, you know, Maybe it is time. What, what do you think when you think about a human rights city? I think just to um, add to on this point, um, not even just the, I suppose, the reliance in our generation, because yes, we will change things and we have to change things, but also the intergenerational work, um, which goes back to our earlier conversation. Um, that's super important because we can't learn from our history um, if we don't have those conversations and if we don't have the elders present there and to inform our future. So I think that's very important and that will add to the human rights city. Also, um, I want to include um, a comedian called Hassan Minhaj. Um, He's an American uh, comedian, and um, I, I just I was thinking about uh, one of the things that he had mentioned on his um, parents and um, them being immigrant parents from India traveling over to America, and how they were trying to survive, but we're out here trying to live. So I thought that's a really nice kind of like touch on a human rights city is trying to live. So going from surviving to living and thriving mm -hmm. um and that can look like the points that andy had mentioned but yeah just keep it simple i think that yeah the, the idea to fully realize your potential is you know that's what your dream is is a, isn't it you want to realize your potential and then you want to realize that you're not going to realize it by making somebody else's potential a bit too squashed you know that's the thing what about you emma what would be a human rights city um I I think coming as a young person, education on human rights and having the ability to, to enforce them, because I think a lot of the time human rights can be violated, but there's just no accountability and there's no way for people to shape them. And, and I think there is this utopia where obviously no human rights are violated, but it, it's very distant future. But I think in the short term, people having the education on what human rights are, because if I was to ask a lot of people my age, they won't have a clue what human rights are, never mind how they could enforce them or how they're entitled to them. So having that education of what they are, but then having a body where people could go and say, my human rights have been violated, how are you going to fix this? Because it's well and good having them, but if you can't be enforced, then they're not much use. And again, it's the, turning those words into action and ensuring that the, these things that people are entitled to aren't just things, the actions that are taken to ensure that they're protected. And so a human rights city for me would be a place where they can be upheld and people, no matter your age, gender, race, ethnicity, can, can actively make sure that they are reinforced and that just because maybe you don't have a certain level of privilege with access to a good lawyer, that that somehow means you aren't entitled to them and for them to be protected fully. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm struck by what you said, Andy, which is that you read the Human Rights Declaration, they're fantastic, yep. but you think, God, there's a huge amount still to do. So if you just take the right to education, okay, well, we, we just heard from Saita that, that there's like 160 million uh, child labourers, at least, and that doesn't include unknown child labourers in China, and, uh, you know, obviously they don't have an education. Um, so that's one extreme. 
but we also have very different educational possibilities for kids in our own country, depending on where they live and what resources the schools have got. And that's not yeah. equality. So that's just an example. Of you can have yeah. the basic right, but it doesn't mean it's an equal right. Well, that's what I was trying to say to you, that some people, young people growing up in this city do not have security over the basics, mm -hmm. uh, over food. And I think it's really interesting, isn't it, that it's taken a footballer to um, be that voice to the government rather than it's what I was saying before about you know, this generation. And I think it's fantastic. We're proud of Marcus and what, what he's done. But it's interesting that it's, it's that voice of that generation from outside of politics that is actually speaking that level of truth to yes. power. But we saw it also with education. You know, and education is more than school, isn't it, these days? If you are not connected, if you're not online, you're not, you're not learning, actually. And you know, we saw that in the pandemic where there were homes where they just kids couldn't afford the, dev the devices or the, the data, you know, and, and yeah. that, you know, so actually 70 what years on from the declaration, 73 years on, those, no those noble aims have actually gone backwards, I would say, uh, in recent times. Um, you know, we, we say everyone in from a homelessness point of view during the pandemic, but then we go, oh, but that's, that's, that's fine, or we, we can forget that now. I mean, the fact that we can't, as a country, say that, you know, we, we give everyone uh, a roof over their head. And there's just one, one point to make. Actually, it's worse than that, because even in human rights are, are not enshrined in UK law. There is a, 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 an act of parliament that gives, makes sure that people who've no immigration status have no recourse to public funds. So how, how can you enact those rights yeah. when the law of the land actually is, is saying that it's okay to leave some people destitute? That, I mean, that is what it's saying. And I just think that in the context of this conversation today, we do have to acknowledge first, before we can promote a, a human rights city, that the concept of human rights have been under pretty, it's been under pretty sustained attack uh, from right-wing newspapers, politicians, for quite a long period of time now, as though that human rights are about doing some people up and then other people down and you know, doing the majority down. That's the way that they yeah. constantly por portray it. And the truth of the matter is, they have undermined public support for human rights. And the fact of that entrenches privilege then, doesn't it? Yeah. All forms of privilege are entrenched when you undermine public support for human rights. So it's why this conference is so important. It's why we're absolutely uh, just thrilled that Kerry came to us in the first place. We're just delighted with the kind of the job that the Robert F. Kennedy uh, Foundation has done, you know. And I can promise everybody involved in it, you know, we will carry forward what has happened here in recent days in, in, in to promoting the concept of human rights. You know, everybody needs, all communities now have people within those communities who don't have food security, don't have security in their workplace, don't have housing security. So you've got to re-promote human rights in that context, that this is about every single community which is, is, is unable to protect itself now because of the way the world has changed. And you know, I think that's, um, that's that's the scale of the challenge before us, Jude. Yes. Jay, what's your human rights vision for a city? I think it's really interesting listening to you and what you said about thinking spaces resonates particularly. I, mean, I live in London, so it's essentially become highly gentrified, um, impossible to live in, really. Um, and highly surveyed, militarised police, um, private enterprises owning what looks like public space, demolition of estates where ordinary people used to live, decimation of the housing stock by right by. So my view of a, of a, of a human rights city, if, if, if we're going to look at it that way, would be a grassroots city. And by that, I mean justice for Grenfell. I mean the end of joint enterprise and substantial injustice. I mean the end of allowing London well-heeled trolls to consistently undermine, as you said, and attack trans rights. All of the dog whistle skepticism as well that we see in, in, in right-wing press particularly, but, but in other presses as well that undermine 
climate action and the act activism of people like yourself and people of my generation as well who've been horribly act um, affected by all of this stuff. I'm talking about the end of stop and search, which I have also been affected by. Um, you know, it, we can talk in abstractions, but those are the, that's the reality, isn't it? Those yeah. are the actual things that need to happen. So I think of it in terms of that. Okay, audience, um, what about you? What have you been dreaming about in your human rights city? Uh, I think Jay's just pointed out, you know, we must make sure that we don't feel ridiculous for dreaming things, because people want us to feel ridiculous for believing in equality, and it's not, it's not a stupid thing. We shouldn't be humiliated for having that dream. Um, anybody got a thought on their human rights city or a question they want to put? You're all sitting dreaming there now, aren't you? <laughs> Yeah, microphone in the middle there. Thanks. I'm just wondering if the panel um, have in mind already a city that already exists, which is as close as possible to what you believe is a human rights city. Okay, what's Anywhere this? in the world. Anywhere in the world, mm -hmm. there's a city you imagine. I'm going to take two or three questions at the same time. Can you keep your hands up, people? So you, you give it to Dave at the back and then those two people there. Thanks. I think it was Ken Livingston said that um, if voting changed anything, it would be abolished. <clears throat> and in the last election, we saw voting change something for something that many of us didn't want. Um, uh, and it feels that a lot of people have been disenfranchised from the political process, um, which is leading to lots of fantastic direct action. Um, what do we do to re-enfranchise people and engage them in political processes again? Okay, thank you. Microphone there. Um, this is probably for Emma specifically, um, but as youth activists, and you kind of touched on it there, it kind of feels like a lot of the reason we're in this space is out of moral obligation and a duty of care to those around us and those frontline communities across the world that are already experiencing climate change. As someone recently asked me a question that was really thought provoking and quite profound, which was if the world wasn't on fire and hopefully when the world isn't on fire what will you be doing with your life instead of this hmm. okay do you want to pass it forward there's one more question there in front of you yeah um it's not not exactly a question but just two comments on what's been said um the first the first one about um the food the food lobby and marcus rushford um I saw something on television lately that, in fact, there was a young woman in Willenshaw who, who was very active in getting the whole movement going. So I think perhaps I'd say for this discussion that, that, that there needs to be kind of recognition of the role of grassroots people who are very often women, because it's very often women who do the organising. And, I mean, what a canny operator to actually get someone with the high profile that that particular footballer has. So that's my first point. And the other point um, actually is to you, Andy. I, I heard you say, us generational politicians have messed up. I think I heard you say that. And so the next generation, you take over and make it right. Two things. I think you haven't messed up with everything. You have done some good things. Um, I mean, getting elected again actually was pretty good because otherwise I think we might have had some Tories who <laughs> would have not been, I think, sympathetic to this. But, I mean, the homelessness stuff you, you've done and fronted up on, and, uh, and there will be a lot of other things. So I think you should be, you should be proud of what you've achieved because the other side of that is, you, I'm a bit older than you, so you, we can't hand it on to someone else to say, oh, we messed this all up, now you sort it all out. <laughs> I mean, that's, uh, that's a tough ask. Yeah. So that's what I want. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, okay, a city, Andy, is there any city that you would, I mean, you've probably globally trotted maybe more than any of us, I don't know. <laughs> what, what would you say, oh, there's a city I would admire and say, if, if only we could be a bit more like that? 
Is there one? Oh, I, I don't think there is, if I'm honest. You know, I'd, I wish I could say there was, but I, I, I think it might be um, kind of sort of like a false nirvana, if you know what I mean. Oh, this city gets, gets everything perfect. I think some of the Scandinavian cities get, get close. So I think some of them are, but you, know, you would look there for inspiration. I, I remember being more moved anywhere in the world than, than when I went to Zambia, actually, when I was a Home Office minister, and I went to a refugee camp in the north of Zambia. And the minister there was uh, speaking to... I was in front of thousands and thousands of people in a refugee camp, and he was telling them all... Because they'd all come over the border, border from the Congo, and he was telling them all how they were all his brothers and sisters, and every single one of them was welcome. And I remember the debate that was going on here at the time about asylum and immigration. I just remember that. that I'll, I'll never forget that, actually. Um, you know, in a country that had barely anything was just welcoming thousands. And, and I think maybe I would look at some of the African countries, I, I, would, I would say. I think you'll find a, a humanity there that is probably beyond a lot of Western, Western cities, to be honest with you. And I think that's where, if I was to, to look... I, I thank you for what you said on the... If I should just take the Keep point going, about... Yeah. about um, Politics. I was probably overstating it a little, I guess, but I, I'm serious in what I said, though, and I fell out of love with Westminster, trying to you know, be there all those years, and genuinely seeing sort of politicians constantly playing the media, but not actually interested in making substantial change. I'm, you, know, you might remember I, I proposed a big reform of social care. It's just, a, it's just an example. It's been in the news recently, and my own side wouldn't back it. You know, I, I, that was a really big sort of thing for me when I, you know, it was a national care service I proposed, you know, social care on NHS principles. I just thought, well, surely that's logical now, given how much the NHS promotes human rights and, you know, equality. But, you know, no, even my own party wouldn't, wouldn't back it. The, the fight I had on Hillsborough and the truth for the Hillsborough families, again, having to fight my own side and the machine of government, it was pretty terrifying, I'll, I'll be honest. And so I guess what I'm saying is, and this is actually what Dave was, was touching at, you know, it, that is what creates the alienation, I think, in the end. Because I, if you go back, in the, I think there were politicians that were bigger and kind of more action-oriented in the past. And I think we've lost that some, somewhere along, along the line. You know, politics has become very much about, I don't know, just, you know, uh, public positioning and you know and it isn't about making making substantial uh, change happen uh, and I think that's that's a big reason why we're in the, the mess that we're, we're in and some of the points that you mentioned about um, um, joint enterprise um, just the you know things that are unjust just kind of get missed by by Parliament on that on that on that level and and you know I, I this is a piece of you know, reflection they've all bought the idea that the market will solve everything you know, the you know, that, and the, all sides have been buying into that haven't they since the, since the 80s it doesn't, you, you leave buses to the market in this city and what happens you end up with no services and bus fares that cost £4, you, know, you, you leave housing to the market and what happens it all gets sold off and you can't, people can't get, so th I guess this is what I'm saying you know, people have bought into mantras that were plainly wrong, mantras because they appeal to certain newspapers to get elected, but they're plainly wrong, and they haven't. People haven't had the courage of their convictions to say that mentality does not build a human rights culture in, in anywhere in a city, in a country, anywhere. And I think that's where change is real. Change is is needed. You need to start to guarantee things in law, a right to decent, safe housing in UK law. That, that should be a human right in this country because you can't have a good life without good housing. Impossible. Right to food should be in law. You know, I just think these. This is the kind of change I think that's um, the change that's that's needed. And I do think the generation of politicians of which I was a part. It's why I left, to be honest. It's why I left Westminster and came to do this. I just, I, I lost faith in the whole in the whole thing. And um, I, I and I, you know, how you get it back, Dave? I don't know. I think it is about bottom up, networking people, opening doors for people that let people reshape it, I think, is the way to do it. Left to their own devices down there, it, it ain't going to happen. Definitely not.
there was a, an interesting question, which is, again, it's, it's an, a question for the imagination, which is, you know, supposing we had got racial justice completely, supposing we had got gender justice completely, you know, that, that ableism wasn't a thing anymore, you know, that, that, that all the different kinds of ways that we have structured inequality and kept it inside the structures, so if all that had evaporated, what would we do with our time? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's an interesting thing, isn't it, with the, the, the kind of capacity to struggle. I mean, you know, obviously there's joy in the work that you do, but would you prefer not to have the burden of representation and the burden of, you know, speaking on behalf of? That's a really interesting question. Um, and no, in a weird way, because it's all I kind of know. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's all I know, so, um, no, and, and the experiences that I've had and gone through and seen others go through um, are the reasons why I do what I do, um, and that care, that collective community, um, that collective community, and even the absence of collective community, like community effort is a reason why I'm doing what I'm doing, because I haven't seen it, and also, maybe I have seen it somewhere else, or it's that imagined human rights city um, that I'd like to see. So, um, yeah, that was maybe a juxtaposition of answers, but, yeah. What about you, Emma? Um, I think, for me, I, I, would, I would love a world where I didn't have to fight for my future, as you were saying, where the planet wasn't burning and where people didn't have to, I didn't have to lift, lift up the voices of people in MAPA countries because they just weren't getting the platforms that I am as someone in the global north. But I think there's, even if that, that is all eradicated and there's just no inequality, there's always going to be a space for community. And I think I would always see my role in that and helping to, to bring people together and helping to, to cultivate people and to help people get the most out of the, the skills that they've got and their passions, because I think everyone has so much within them. And the only reason it isn't realised is because they just don't have the people to believe in them or they don't have the access to the opportunities to do that. And I think even in a world where there isn't inequalities, there's still that aspect of bringing people together and helping people. And I think that's just something, I don't know whether I've, my parents have raised me to be like that, whether that's just something that's sort of just so deeply rooted in me that I just love community and I love helping to bring people together and, and being a part of that. And um, I, can, I can always see that as being my sort of role mm -hmm. that I'd like to do. I mean, absolutely. You know, there might still be loneliness. There might still be all different kinds of sadnesses. There might be many reasons why we have to carry on building community regardless of rights, if you like. But one of the things just to leave you with before I ask Jay to read the poem is that, um, you know, we talked about the frontiers of human rights in one of the sessions. And... Um, uh, Peter Tatchell and um, uh, others were saying, well, you know, robots' rights, wh where do we go with that one? Pr other primates' rights, where do we go with that one? And then Mary Robinson this morning talking about the new rights for the species that are not us. So the new, new frontiers of rights will appear, are appearing, uh, wh when we kind of readjust the idea that it isn't just humans that matter, so I was just going to jump, just to, I, I just was reflecting on your question though, I mean, imagine how, imagine if people didn't have to fight in the way that, that they do though, imagine how much positive energy would be if people were released from that. Mm. I, I read Michael Holding's book over the summer, I, I would recommend it to anybody in this, in this room. Um, you know, Michael, if you, the cricket commentator, former fast bowler, did you see him once where he gave, the, just shortly after the murder of George Floyd, he gave yeah. this like long speech on Sky Sports, where his kind of weariness just kept, did he see it? Yeah, I mean, it's it was amazing. Just, it, yeah. And then he's written this book called um, Why We Kneel, How We Rise, and I would rec absolutely recommend it to anybody. But what he talks of is a sort of a life of weariness, if you like, you know, because yeah. he goes in the shop and he's conscious that the security guard is looking at him, but not. Do you know what I mean? If you if you freed people from that, yeah, and you kind of set everybody up t equally. At, properly to, and, and set people up to succeed rather than some people to fail. The amount of energy that you would release in a different way, Ooh. I just think would be... You know, Amazing. I, I think we set people up to fail and we set them up for life to fail and then they kind of have this, have to have this negative energy if you like, all their life, fighting, fighting, fighting. 
if you, imagine if you had a universal basic income and a right to housing and you know, a right to everything you need for an education. You would set people up to succeed. And probably we wouldn't spend as much money then on failure. We spend money, huge amounts of money on failure in this, yeah. don't we? We do. You know. Anyway, sorry, you just, you just prompted me there because I do think, you know... Invest in people's success rather well, than paying for the cleaning up of the mess that we've all made would be I, a wonderful way of rethinking how we do things. Absolutely. So can I just add as um, well, just, just to add as well, like thinking about the basis of yeah. our society as well. The basis of our society is that all of our activity is directed towards the needs of capital. So as long as that is the basis of all of our towns and cities and our lives are directed towards that, then we're always going to have these problems. So we have to look at the economic side of it, right? We have to look at who profits and why they insist on our lives being kind of lived and, and directed and controlled in these ways. People don't fail for no reason. People fail because it's profitable. You know, we've got to remember that. I'm going to give a mayoral edict before this conference ends, which is I'm asking all of you to read Why We Kneel, How We Rise. I promise you it will change the way you think, and then you've got to recommend it to ten other people. I'm thinking of maybe demanding every person in public services a great demand to read it as well. I, I'm toying with that idea because, honestly, it, people need to. We've got to get more serious about this fight against inequality and injustice. Yeah. The pandemic has shown us that. You know, we are not equal in any way, shape or form, if we're honest. Miles from it. And we've got to take inspiration from, you know, it wasn't just markers with food. It was that England team that stood up to the government over the taking of the knee. We've got to, everyone's got to start listening to what they're saying and get more serious about tackling injustice because it's all around us I'm afraid yeah and, uh, yeah we need and people like me need to get more more outspoken about it okay well we'll we'll, yeah. we'll, look, we'll let you do yeah. that we will we definitely will read the book everybody <laughs> okay so J Jay is reading tonight with other poets and on the on m Friday night we had one of the great poet royalty members Linton Quasi Johnson and he read a, fr a poem from the 70s and from the 80s and from the 90s speaking of the huge racial injustice and the police action against young people and not just young people. And, you know, he showed both the fact that he had this, still got this fire in his belly, but also kind of what you were saying, like he could have had a different life if it wasn't for the one that he had. And to, to kind of carry that weariness and that anger, it's a thing, it's a thing. Um, so we were honored to have him and Jay were honored to have you kind of carrying the baton forward. So over to you. Appreciate it. <laughs> um, one of the really weird things about being a poet in this context is that obviously as poets, we don't have the, the burden of governance. Um, every now and then you do get a poet who's an MP, but it's rare. And, um, <laughs> and so we're always coming at it from this kind of slightly different angle. and. And I thought it was really interesting whoever said that at the very beginning about the vulnerability of kind of being in politics. I, I always think about that. But anyway, I got um, Article 28, which is um, an article that talks about um, creating the conditions uh, in which the human rights, the preceding human rights articles can exist. And I think it's a really, really interesting one for that reason. Um, the kind of key words is that you can create a world that is free and fair. So I decided um, to look at the small, the, the micro level, like I said, the, the street level, um, the neighborhood level. And I wanted to talk about or write about something that happened um, to me and my family at the end of last year. So this is an entirely true story and it's called Free and Fair. Our stab wounds were not self-inflicted, Sean Bonney. A man is stabbed. One of two things can happen. He bleeds to death. An officer saves him. So an officer saves him. One of two things can happen. The man is grateful, celebratory. The officer is lauded as a hero. The officer is lauded as a hero. In the papers, the stabbed man lives because the officer broke down the door 
pulled a tea towel tight around the wound. A tea towel is pulled tight around the wound. One of two things is true. The assailants are found. The assailants get away. So the assailants get away. The man, his mother, the house are covered in blood when the officer lauded as hero saves the man's life. Having saved the man's life, the officer finds drugs laid out on a table, or he finds the assailants hiding in the night. The officer finds drugs laid out on a table. The papers don't say that the officer charges the man whose life he saved. A court date is set. Either the stabbed man recovers and is acquitted, the assailants are caught and tried. The stabbed man is tried and sentenced, the assailants vanish and are free. So the assailants vanish and are free. The stabbed man is tried, sentenced. A free trial, a fair hearing. He is led away with his arm in a sling. Ancient theatre this. A man is stabbed, calls out, invites the wrath of what he called upon. And ancient law. Life given and taken, as sure as life is given and taken. Thank you. So thank you everybody for being part of festival um, weekend and, and all the things we try to do to make ripples. Go and be a ripple. Um, and uh, thank you for all the rippling that you're doing, the four of you. Thank you to our signers again. And please go and join Young Identity outside and then join us for the, for the final poetic declaration tonight. It's been heartwarming and um, invigorating and tiring. And it'll be a marvellous thing tomorrow to get going on everything we need to do. Okay, bye-bye.